Our next speaker is Gaetan Burgio from Australian National University, and we're switching gears to um, infectious disease. So good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I will um, present today my work on malaria, which is a little bit different to all the talks we have been uh, listening uh, from this session. So. Malaria is a tropical disease, as you most know, that is um, pretty lethal and affects quite a lot of people um, it's working? Yeah. in Africa, uh, South America, and Asia. And uh, it kills way more than Zika, uh, Ebola, or other viruses you can, hear, uh, can, you can hear. And it's a huge concern. Um, the problem we really have with malaria is drug resistance. And I uh, have two examples here, uh, resistant to chloroquine, that is the uh, usual treatment for malaria, and uh, recently, more recently, resistant to artemisinin, which is the, now the uh, drug we use to treat malaria, and that resistance is spreading very rapidly. And this is a huge concern um, in the field. So the uh, we were fortunate because um, basically malaria have selected the human population for uh, various um, um, mutations in the red cells uh, because the malaria parasite need the red cells to survive. And uh, basically these mutations are well known. Uh, you have uh, that one in hemoglobin, the uh, other one in Benfrey, and that one, for example, in G6PD. What is absolutely remarkable is uh, for example, this mutation in a uh, gene called uh, Duffy antigen R. Um, and just a single point mutation uh, impaired the invasion of the plasmodium vivax parasite. And basically what happened um, at um, a large scale is this impairment of uh, plasmodium vivax uh, invasion has basically eradicated the parasite in Africa. You can see here is the Plasmodium falciparum, and there the in blue the Plasmodium vivax, and this mutation is highly prevalent in African population. So the idea is to try to find new genes to reproduce what uh, I would uh, call genetics antimalarial, and this is called in the field uh, host directed therapy. To do this, I use mice. And um, like in human population, mice are more or less susceptible to the malaria parasite. So these mice in uh, black are uh, more susceptible, and these mice in uh, red are uh, more resistant. And basically the idea is to make the susceptible mouse resistant to the malaria parasite. So how I do this? Uh, it's pretty simple. I uh, use uh, forward genetic screen, so you enumerate mutagenesis. So uh, you have heard uh, quite a few talks on this. So we inject you a new, uh, look at the G ones, and every single dot here is a mouse. And I, uh, for example, here look at the uh, blood count. Uh, for example, here the uh, volume of the red cells. And I'm interested at in those ones that are a uh, little bit different from the others. And I uh, look at their red cells and their susceptibility to malaria infection. And uh, so far, I've screened something like 15,000 mice. And um, what comes up uh, from my screen is all sorts of mutations there. Uh, I won't go into detail today, uh, but um, there are various uh, pathways there. And um, so, for example, compared to the uh, previous talk, MPD3, we just described and uh, gets up succeed in blood yesterday. Um, what I can claim is with my UNU mutagenesis, I've been uh, so far more, um, um, uh, way more, um, um, uh, sorry, I've been uh, very efficient, more efficient than uh, exome sequencing of 10,000 patients uh, and spending $10 billion uh, from the NH. Anyway, so I will talk today about uh, the red cell cytoskeleton um, and it's uh, absolutely uh, very interesting. So the cytoskeleton is uh, composed with this uh, B-lipid uh, layer with, um, as a net, 
and uh, each node have uh, the structure uh, that maintain the integrity of the red cells with here the alpha spectrine, the beta spectrine, uh, anchorin 1, band 3 uh, there. And uh, today we talk about this beta spectrine uh, mutant we have characterized. So we have uh, found from this uh, screen two mutants there, one uh, with um, stop codon there, and the other one with the loss of function, and those are resistant to malaria parasite with a drop in parasitemia, and they survive uh, up to 90%. So the question is, what is the mechanism of resistance? And I will spend the rest of my talk on this. Uh, basically, you have um, various ways to resist to the malaria parasite. So basically, the, para the parasite uh, can't invade, can't grow, can't uh, egress, or uh, get uh, cleared from um, the, the, the immune system and the spleen. So I thought, oh, okay, I give uh, this mutant to a student. It will be uh, pretty obvious that if you um, change the red cell, the parasite won't grow or won't invade. That would be easy. Uh, we just have to do one or two experiments, we publish the paper and we'll be fine. Um, this is what we did, and um, the, I, um, so the way we do is basically you fluorescent label the mutant, you fluorescent label the wild type or another mutant, you put the, the label red cells into an infected mouse, and you look at the proportion of the infected uh, fluorescent red cells using flow cytometry. It's a, some sort of competitive assay. And um, what, uh, what happened is you measure the, num uh, the uh, infected red cells after two minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, up to 24 to 48 hours. And uh, what happened here is at uh, 10, 10, min to 20, uh, 10 minutes, nothing happened. And after you can see a drop uh, so, uh, of the uh, infected red cells in uh, mutant compared to wild type. What that means is basically uh, there we were quite surprised because nothing will happen here, so that means the invasion is not uh, affected. And here, something uh, there that could be the, the growth, so we said, oh, okay, that's possibly the growth. But we looked at the remaining red cells, so this, we can look at the remaining red cells uh, in there, and uh, what happened is, since here's the uninfected, and these are the infected ones, and straight away the um, number of red cells drops, whereas they are not infected. So that means the growth is certainly not the mechanism. It's a certainly no, uh, something else that the mechanism, uh, that the growth or the invasion. So we were quite disappointed because I, um, I don't have my small experiment to publish my paper, so I have to do a little bit more work. So the uh, hypothesis where uh, that's um, clearly the, um, grow, uh, the, um, the clearance of the parasite. So to, to do this, we did two experiments. We splenectomized the mice. Uh, the, splenectomized, uh, the mouse splenectomy um, restored partially this uh, defect, but what was the absolutely um, important experiment is uh, one of my students has the idea to uh, inject LPS. So if you know what LPS does, uh, LPS is a dead bacteria and uh, basically uh, stimulate the in uh, innate immunity. And uh, what we did is to inject the LPS and what was very clear is we could reproduce the phenotype we've seen before. So that means that the parasite get cleared and uh, throughout the stimulation of the LPS. Um, the second experiment we did is we look at the uh, macrophages um, and how we do is kind of the same experiment. You know, we fluorescent label uh, the red cells in wild type and mutant and we co-incubate with the macrophages and uh, we look at the phagocytic and no phagocytized uh, macrophages. The way we do is here you have a marker for the nucleus um, that indicates um, presence of the parasite, uh, marker for uh, macrophage, and uh, you can see those parasites that are uh, phagocytized. And that what was very clear is if we look at uninfected, nothing happened, and on infected red cells, that uh, is very clear that 
um, the mice that are mutants um, are so the um, mutant so the uh, mutant parasitized uh, red cells are more likely to get cleared uh, from phagocytosis. So to, to, to recap, um, the, the story is uh, the mice that carry these uh, beta spectrin mutation uh, don't impair uh, growth and invasion. That's not the mechanism. The mechanism uh, goes um, with uh, the clearance of the red cell within the spleen, but not only the spleen, probably uh, the circulation and the liver. And um, the, 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 the trigger is the activation of the innate immunity and uh, macrophages activation. So the, the next question is what exactly the mechanism is. And uh, to do this, um, I had um, basically uh, CRISPR at the rescue. Uh, what, I did, what I did is to make a CRISPR mouse that has um, mutation in uh, the domain, uh, binding domain between spectrin and anchorin 1, uh, the other protein that's just uh, binding to, to spectrin. Uh, the mutation is there. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that and uh, we challenged with malaria to confirm that the mutation does something to the malaria parasite, and we look at the red cell as well, so it does have a phenotype, uh, and if we look at the malaria phenotype, that's pretty clear that it improved considerably the survival, like um, pretty much the same level that I had with the other uh, spectrum mutant, uh, with a clear drop of the parasitemia. So what I did is a very simple uh, assay, is to look at um, uh, another protein called ben free. So basically, these proteins are all together, and if you disrupt one, you disrupt the others. So the um, idea is to look at uh, this protein called ben free. So ben free is important because it's linked to the uh, clearance of the red cells. So what we did is a simple microscopy assay called FRAP. Uh, basically, what it does, as it uh, shows on the cartoon, uh, on the uh, movies there, uh, basically the uh, assay just uh, bleach uh, your uh, red cells and you look at the recovery uh, with a specific antibody linked to ben free. And it measures the uh, motility of this ben free prot protein. And uh, what is uh, shows there, so you have um, the bleach there and the two recovers. What was very clear from the experiment we have performed is on wild type there's no recovery, uh, whereas in the mutant we have a huge recovery and re huge and rapid recovery. What that means is uh, basically you, uh, this mutation uh, changed the red cell scaffold, uh, free up a lot of ben free, and this uh, ben free is motile through on the surface of the red cells. Um, so there, so the um, so the spectrin is interaction with the anchorin one. You disrupt this. What happened? It uh, released the uh, ben free that uh, uh, that is free on the red cells, and that um, let's say attract. Uh, the innate immunity and uh, prone to clearance. And as well, uh, change the uh, red cell deformability. So that's um, basically uh, the story. So what we are trying to do is to uh, better understand this, to look more into the uh, mechanistic of this. That's the uh, current hypothesis that we have. So what I would like to do is to uh, thank uh, all the members of my group um, and the two students that have performed uh, all these work. So I just uh, give you a brief snapshot, but in fact, it's more complicated. It's a, a, more, so a lot of intriguing um, uh, biology in, uh, in there. So Ming and Pat. Uh, of course, Simon Foote uh, for these uh, advices, and uh, I am funding, I'm funded from the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia, uh, increase uh, Bill Gates, I receive a little bit of money from Bill Gates, and I will perform this work in Japan uh, because I receive uh, funding from the Academy of Science in Australia. Um, thanks, and I'm happy to take some questions.
questions. Uh, I have one. So do you think this could potentially have some clinical application in the future and how would you go about that? Absolutely. So the, um, yes, there is uh, a clear uh, clinical application. So um, one thing I didn't mention because I, for lack of time is I generate uh, as well this mutant for uh, drug screening. So the idea is to disrupt the binding of these two protein and to uh, found a um, small molecule compound that could mimic this and uh, given that it's resistant to the malaria parasite, we can apply this to patients, absolutely. That's very good.